Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Great is the Lord and worthy of all praise. Amen. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Hear these words of Scripture. Love one another, for love is of God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Spirit Spirit of God, God, search our hearts. Let us remember in silence our need for God's forgiveness. Let us confess our sins to God. God of mercy, we have sinned against you and against others. We have sinned in what we have done and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. Forgive us all that is past and raise us to newness of life. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us rejoice in the rock of our salvation. We sing to you, O God, and bless your name. And tell of your salvation from day to day. We proclaim your glory to the nations. Your glory to the ends of the earth. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion which cannot be moved, but stands fast forever. The hills stand about Jerusalem. So does the Lord stand around about his people from this time forth for forevermore. The scepter of the wicked shall not hold sway over the land allotted to the just, so that the just shall not put their hands to evil. Show your goodness, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are true of heart. 
As for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will lead them away with the evildoers, but peace be upon Israel. Glory Glory to the the Father, Father, and to the Son, and and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as as it was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and shall be forever. Amen. The reading is from James. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the other who is for you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who, they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For for the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, and also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as as who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what, what is the good of that? So, by faith, so faith by itself, it has no works, is dead. Here was the Spirit the saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our response to the reading is the Song of Zechariah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets you promised of old that you would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. You promise to show mercy to our forebears and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous in your sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way to give God's people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him 
and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond all measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Together, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God, God, the Father Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also bless you. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Make your ways known upon earth, O God. Your saving power among all peoples. 
Renew your church in holiness. And help us to serve you with joy. Guide the leaders of this and every nation. That justice may prevail throughout the world. Let not the needy, O God, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Make us instruments of your peace. And let your glory be over all the earth. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Holy and ever-living God, by your power we are created, and by your love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live each day in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Picture this scene. It's past dark, and you're on a mostly deserted city street. Out of the corner of your eye, you notice a stranger walking your way. There's no way your paths aren't going to cross fairly closely. The stranger has a scruffy look about him, dark skin, walks with a slight limp, and is dressed in shabby clothes. What do you do? Cross to the other side of the street? Hold your purse a little more tightly? I don't judge these responses or any similar ones. I certainly do such things myself unconsciously often enough. The question is, why? Is it because we have the conscious thought that this person is likely to harm our person or property? I suggest that this isn't usually the case. I believe it's usually something far more subtle than that. What I believe is going on there is that we all too often unconsciously act according to the belief that what we perceive as being a blight, a mark of uncleanness in another person, is something contagious from which we need to keep as much distance as possible. How often do we act as if someone's blackness or their poverty or their disability will rub off on us if we let it. Apparently, even Jesus wasn't immune to this tendency. As an observant Jew, he would have been well and thoroughly trained to have his guard up as high as possible when approached by a Gentile woman. She was unclean to him on so many levels. And yet this Gentile woman turned out to be the voice of the Spirit, calling the God-man to account. No matter how unclean you may imagine I am, she tells the Messiah, I too am worthy of a divine blessing, and I have no intention of giving up until you give me one. And in case the point here isn't clear enough, 
we also have today's passage from James. He really couldn't say it any more plainly. If we're going to call ourselves Christians, individually and collectively, there can be no favoritism, no exclusivity. But putting this into practice is far easier said than done. An environment in which there is truly no exclusion and no partiality seems impossibly difficult to achieve. And yet today's scriptures tell us that we must never stop striving for just such an environment. I must say I am proud to belong to a church that took a very particular stance during the AIDS crisis. In the mid to late 80s, when most churches were closing their doors and shunning those who had any connection with the disease, our Episcopal Church made a very different decision. Perhaps the most emblematic act was the decision on the part of our local bishop at the time not only to continue serving communion in both kinds without in any way discriminating according to HIV status, but that he would be the last to drink from the common cup every Sunday. Keep in mind that this was during a time when it was still largely unknown what AIDS really was and how it is transmitted. There was good reason to believe that this was an extremely risky move. This was a costly decision, to put it mildly. It cost the Episcopal Church quite a bit of credibility in Christian circles where, at the time, nearly all of the supposedly respectable Christians were shunning and excluding anyone affected by HIV, claiming that there were very good reasons to do so on both a moral and a public health level. Now, was this a stance that perfectly eliminated all partiality and exclusivity? No, certainly not. It was met with anger, terror, and perhaps both by many. And one could argue that this was an act of favoritism against those who felt that way. But was it a faithful attempt to live into what we hear in today's scriptures? I would say that it was. So what about now? What does a faithful attempt to live into the lesson taught by Jesus, taught to Jesus, by the Syrophoenician woman, and into the words of St. James, look like in our current context? This is not a simple or easy question to answer. Living into the precepts in the scriptures is a very difficult challenge, one that is, without God's grace, entirely impossible. One thing that Scripture demonstrates pretty clearly, however, is that the faithful answers are often going to look pretty wild and messy. Now, I'm sorry, I know that's the last thing you want to hear. Life already feels intolerably wild and messy right now. And the last thing we need is even more, right? But James said it plainly. Mercy triumphs over judgment every single time. And mercy is usually pretty wild and messy. Mercy demands that no matter how much meat we might want to, we resist the urge to enact rigid policies in times like these 
the urge to adopt inflexible categories in our minds regarding who and what we should include and who and what we should exclude. Mercy demands that we remain soft-hearted even when the fear and anger in us and around us are at a fever pitch. Perhaps the greatest example I see in our midst of where this is happening is in the work of the Interfaith Sharing Food Pantry here at St. Bart's. Huge modifications have needed to be made over the last 18 months. Many longtime volunteers have stopped serving. There were times when there appeared to be a threat of the authorities shuttering the operation, at least temporarily. But this food pantry, thanks to its faithful leadership, has not missed a single week of providing basic bodily necessities to neighbors of ours who need it the most. Talk about mercy. Perhaps the most useful question we can ask ourselves is who and what are we viewing as unclean? Where are the situations where we feel most compelled to shun and to exclude? These are the places where I believe that God, via passages of scripture such as the ones that we heard today, is urging us to embrace more mercy. I'm not suggesting that it's easy. At times it might feel downright scary and dangerous, and there are no perfect answers but I think that we can rest assured of one thing. The neat and clean answers, the answers that feel safe and well-packaged, are probably not the most faithful answers. We serve a God who shows us in Christ a wild and risky mercy, and that God calls upon us to do the same.
Sisters and brothers, I invite you now to join me in prayer. In the silence that follows each bidding, please feel free to voice aloud the prayers of your heart or offer them up to God in silence. I invite your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for the Anglican Communion, for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and especially for the province of the Episcopal Church of Sudan, for the Episcopal Church in our diocese, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Mark, our bishop, and especially St. Cyprian's Church in San Francisco, for the faith communities in our region, especially the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Livermore. Please pray for all peoples and assemblies of faith. I invite your prayers for the world, for peace among all nations and peoples, for an end to wars, poverty, and oppression, for wisdom and grace to be given to all in positions of public trust and power. Please pray for the world and its peoples. I invite your prayers for this congregation and its members, that we might continually grow in love for one another, for God and for one another. Remember especially these members in our weekly cycle of prayer, for John, Gail, Xavier, and Felix, for Nikki, for Steve, and Lanny, as well as those in military service, for Aaron, Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, and Taylor. Please pray for its congregation, our congregation and its people. I invite your prayers for all who respond to God's call to minister to others, that they may be protected and encouraged in the vital work that they do. Remember especially all nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, educators, Brad O and Brad S. Please pay. Please pray for all who care for others in body, mind, and spirit. I invite your prayers for all those who suffer or struggle, that they might find relief and comfort. Remember especially for Olivia, Becky, Bert and Judy, for Brett M, for Carol, Kathy, Dave and Mary, for Doris, for Aaron, for Esteban, Miroslava and Tamara, for Glennis, James, Ashley, Matt, and Darian, for Geraldine, for um Helen, for Umberto, Candida, and family, for Janice and Bravo, for Jim, for Joanne, for John and Hiroko, for Kip, for Lee, for Lisa B, for Laura, Luke, Marion, Marge B, 
from Mary L., for Monty and Judy, for Nick, for Nora, for Michael, Sandra, and Henrietta, for Michael E., for Michael R., for Steve W. and children, for Tamara S., for Ron, Diana, and Barbara, for the Krejcik family, for Robert, Reverend Jennifer Nelson and family, for the Christensen family, for all the souls affected by wildfires and flooding throughout the world, and for all those left behind in Kabul. For the people of Haiti, Afghanistan, and the military all around the world, and especially for the people in who were flooded in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And we wish a special happy St. Teresa Day for our brothers and sisters who celebrate here in this church. And a very special birthday wish for Father Andy today and for Jason C. on Friday. Please pray for all those in any need or trouble. I invite your prayers for all those who have died, that they may rest in their nearer presence of Christ, and on the last day, rise together with us to the life immortal. Please remember especially the 13 U.S. heroes who died in Kabul, for Philip K., for Chalopi M., for Clifford Willibus, and for Chris C. Please pray for all of the departed. I invite you to share with God your joys and gratitude, calling to mind all the ways in which God's amazing grace and generosity are felt in your life. Please pray in thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life. Lord God, this week and in these times, it feels like we have more to pray about than time will allow. We need you so much right now. Please come into our hearts, come into our world with the peace and mercy that can come only from your divine majesty. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. We go in the name of Christ.